Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Warren Bebbington, distinguished alumni, members of the Alumni Advisory Committee, alumni fellows, alumni and friends, good evening. And what a beautiful, warm evening it is. My name is Kim Harvey and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Communications at the University of Adelaide. Would you like the lights up a little bit? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Vice-Chancellor, your microphone's on. Thank you. <laughs> I would first like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite, Theberton and Roseworthy are built. It is lovely to see so many familiar faces here this evening. Before I formally introduce Professor Warren Bebbington, I have a couple of housekeeping points to cover. Firstly, the restrooms are located on the ground floor of this building, adjacent to the cafe. Staff will direct you from the foyer of this theatre. In the event of an emergency, and we are required to evacuate, please make your way to the nearest exit. Staff will provide further directions to the Bar Smith Lawns, which is the assembly point. And finally, could you please ensure that your mobile phones are placed on silent? It is now my great pleasure to introduce our Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Warren Bebbington. A Fulbright Scholar, Professor Bebbington studied at the University of Melbourne and in New York at Queen's College, Columbia University and the CUNY Graduate School, completing Master's degrees in Arts, Music and Philosophy and a PhD. Prior to his role at the University of Adelaide, he was Deputy Vice-Chancellor, University Affairs and previously Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Global Relations at the University of Melbourne. He also served as a Dean at the University of Melbourne and at the University of Queensland and before that taught at the Australian National University's School of Music. As a teacher, he won the University of Melbourne Award for Excellence in Teaching Humanities in 2005 and an Australian Teaching, Learning and Teaching Council citation for 30 years of outstanding teaching in 2008. He has appeared frequently as a visiting keynote speaker at universities abroad, including in Dublin and Hong Kong. Professor Bebbington's publications include the Oxford Companion to Australian Music, and he was, for a decade, the music member of the International Advisory Committee for Encyclopaedia Britannica. His national community roles have included seven years as Chair of Music Committees for the Australia Council, Federal Chair of AMEB and Deputy Chair of Youth Music Australia. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Vice-Chancellor and President Professor Warren Bebbington. Thank you, Kim. And as we know, my microphone is on. <coughs> When people hear I'm from music, usually the first question is, how do you get from being in music to being a Vice-Chancellor? And I always give the same answer. If you can run a music school with 130 egotistical performers, you can run a university. Believe you me. <coughs> exactly the same. It's great to see a um, better part of 130 of our alumni here. We've got over 50,000 in Adelaide. Uh, our largest group, of course, as you would expect. And uh, Kim and I have been taking this presentation about our plan all around our branches throughout Australia and indeed across the world. And we suddenly sat down, looked at each other a month or so ago and realised the one place we hadn't done it was in Adelaide. So hence the purpose of tonight and thank you for coming. I don't know uh, how long it is since you've been to the campus. Beautiful evening to come to campus. Uh, and some of you I know have already had a tour of the newest of the buildings on campus, which is the one, at, uh, the one over here, the Braggs, this wonderful science lab uh, building that was finished at the beginning of this year. And then on the other side uh, of this, what's going to be lawn, is the engineering building, which is the second newest of our buildings. And uh, what we're doing at the moment is <coughs> putting down a lawn so you'll be able to stand on the steps of the Bar Smith and you'll be able to look right across to the botanical gardens and there'll be a big uh, space of lawns and trees for students to be in. So there's been a lot of building on campus, though the building the students like most of all is this one, 
which is hub central and when many of you were at university this was probably just a concrete plaza rather unattractive one at that and now it's three floors of um, uh, of library, of computer docking stations, of lounges, of kitchens, of cappuccino places, retail shops and so on. It's open 24-7. You can swipe your card in at any hour of the night and I gather from the swipe usage there's a little peak use at four in the morning. I haven't been in at four in the morning to see exactly what happens in the hub at that point. Who knows? And during the day the hub overflows and then the excess students go down to the State Library where the State Librarian is flat out trying to persuade students that you can't cook on a walk in the State Library <laughs> <coughs> even though you can in our hub. Anyway it's been a tremendous success and uh, so much so we're building eight satellite hubs on our other campuses and our other facilities and indeed other universities are now starting to mimic this wonderful informal learning space idea. Uh, we haven't finished. In a month we're opening at Roseworthy our new equine hospital. I'm sorry it's not a photograph, just a drawing. But I was up there last week and it looks almost like that. Now this will complete our suite of uh, facilities up there for vet veterinary training. And it'll uh, certainly be the best equine hospital in the country. We'll have horses, race horses and uh, coming from right across Northern Territory, Western Australia um, to have procedures done there. It's going to be quite something. And then our biggest project of all, which is down the other end of town, our new uh, integrated clinical school where our hope is we'll have medicine, dentistry uh, and nursing in the new health precinct close to the new Royal Adelaide Hospital. Anyhow, the purpose tonight was to talk about our new strategic plan, which is named after the motto, Beacon of Enlightenment, our university's motto, Sub Cruce Lumen, Light Under the Southern Cross. Um, <coughs> and it's a 10-year plan that takes us to the eve of the university's 150th anniversary in 2024. Um, now, um, Academics are in the habit of giving hour-long orations, but rest assured I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, <coughs> starting to think about uh, a plan for the university, it's good, I think, to reflect on the founding of the University of Adelaide because we were very fortunate to have in our midst here in the 19th century a very, very brilliant Oxford Don, Augustus Short. Um, who campaigned for a university here for 20 years and then became its first Vice-Chancellor. Uh, <clears throat> now a measure of um, what a marvellous teacher Short was is this. This is just one of his classes. This is his class at Christchurch, Oxford in 1835. On the left, Lord Canning, who went on to become Governor-General of Canada. Clemency Canning, he was known as there for the um, uh, the humanity with which he responded to the viciousness of the British Army during the Indian Rebellion. Lord Elgin, who went on to become Governor-General of Canada, still remembered in that country for the enormous role he played in establishing parliamentary democracy there. And then three men who had big careers in the British Parliament. Lord Shaftesbury, <coughs> known as the Poor Man's Earl in London because of a lifelong championship of the London working poor. Lord Granville, for a long time the Foreign Secretary in Britain, who did more than anyone else to keep Britain out of a naval war in the middle years of the 19th century. And then above all, Gladstone, uh, longest serving British Prime Minister and the greatest orator in the British Parliament before Winston Churchill and a lifelong admirer of his old tutor, Augustus Short, who he wrote about late in life. Now you can see that Short had this uncanny knack of producing leaders, but leaders of a certain humane bent. So he had a, a mission in mind when he came to Adelaide, but there were lots of things he didn't like about Oxford in his day and which he didn't want to recreate here. And one of the things he didn't like was that in his time at Oxford, the student body was entirely made up of aristocratic young men. Now, 
to give you a glimpse of what he did, this is a shot of the first library in the University of Adelaide, which is in the Mitchell Building above where my office is today. And if you've ever seen a photograph of a university in the 19th century, you'll know that there's something absolutely unprecedented about this photograph. And that is that more than half of the students sitting at the desks are women. And they weren't there as observers as they were at the University of Sydney or the University of Melbourne. They were there enrolled for degrees. 40 years before they could do that at Oxford, years before they could do it anywhere in the English-speaking world. So Short had a vision of a student body of great democratic breadth. Another thing he didn't like about Oxford was the curriculum, which in his day consisted entirely of Latin, Greek and the classics. Uh, Short wanted engineering, he wanted science, he wanted literature, he wanted art. He wanted the spirit to investigate new fields. <clears throat> when he was appointed Vice-Chancellor, the government also handed him two first staff, both of whom were local Anglican clergymen. And he was furious and made sure that from then on, every professor at the university was appointed on international recruitment from the front ranks of research and scholarship. Uh, and then there was this interest he had in preparing leaders for South Australia, but leaders of a certain kind. Now, his concept was immediately successful, and I could show you many slides about the early outcomes of the University of Adelaide. Ask any lawyer if they've used Salmon's Jurisprudence or Salmon's Law of Torts, and they'll tell you, of course, these are international classics in the field. What the law profession largely doesn't know is they were written by Sir John Salmon when he was here as Professor of Law in the late 19th century. <clears throat> One of the earliest professors in the sciences wins the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, the year after Marie Curie won her second, uh, Sir William Bragg for, and his son for which this theatre is named. And I suppose the climax of that founding era was when Howard Florey graduated and went on to isolate penicillin, probably the most important scientific discovery of the 20th century by an Australian a man that saved millions of lives. So it was a dazzling first error. You won't find a statue of Augustus Short at the front of this university. The statue at the front is of the second Vice-Chancellor, a man of a very different stripe. But there's still a shadow of Short in the way the university is today. Adelaide still punches above its weight in producing leaders. Just in the political sphere, the current Premier, four-fifths of the current Cabinet, the current Lord Mayor. When I did this slide, I was able to say the current Prime Minister, but she isn't uh, anymore, but you get the idea. <clears throat> the makeup of the student body continues to be very distinctive. 16% of the students here are from low socioeconomic backgrounds. That's very unlike the other group of eight universities. At Melbourne University, where I've come from, the figure is 6%. Now, it's not a coincidence. It's not an outcome of the Bradley reforms. It's a tradition that's been there since the beginning. Um, <clears throat> and we've just acquired a huge $9 million grant from the government to, in, um, to enhance even further what we do for disadvantaged students. The tradition of investigating new fields lives on in the interdisciplinary research institutes. And one of the things I liked about the university when I came here was how well the budget's managed. There's a 5% margin here that most Australian universities would die for. Now, in making a 10-year plan, we needed, first of all, to reflect a bit about where things are going in education uh, in the next decade. Let me just summarise uh, a few of the things that uh, concerned us. By 2024, we'll have a completely globalised student market. <clears throat> the Americans are now competing in Asia in countries where we and the UK were absolutely dominant. Um, and of course the dollar's high, which doesn't help. Um, and in any case, the way students choose a university's changed now. It's no longer by visiting its open day, it's by a click of the mouse from anywhere in the world. It's going to be very, very competitive. 25 years of governments in Canberra of both political persuasions progressively reducing funding to Australian universities 
uh, has a produced a situation where Australian universities had only one way of balancing their budget, and that was to grow. This university growed, uh, doubled its size in the last 10 years. Now, when you do that, you will end up with massive classes, 500 students, 800 students, 1,000 students. My eldest son in Biology 1 last year at Melbourne University was in a class of 1,500 students. Now, in an experience like that, it's impersonal, it's massed, and, of course, the content has to be pitched lower. And there's another reason the content's been going, and that is so many of the students work now. The average student works 12 to 15 hours a week, and a significant minority work over 30 hours a week while enrolled full-time. Now, that kind of student rushes out of the lecture back to the job in McDonald's or Safeway and is happy with 51%. <coughs> in surveys, the students tell us that although they're all employed in McDonald's, that's not where they want to be the rest of their life, and they feel they're not getting skills that are going to make them employable as graduates. And then finally, there's what's happened to the student body itself. The all the students we teach now, unlike us, were born with a smartphone in one hand. And the rest of their life is delivered through that little device 24-7. And increasingly, they expect education to be there too. Research has become an enormously expensive business in many disciplines. There's equipment now that we can only afford in partnership with other universities or with government or with industry. Um, in the next 10 years, I believe government grants around the world for research will grow enormously, but they'll be very, very focused on things governments think are important. Counterterrorism, food security, water shortage, and so on. In the next 10 years, the whole generation of baby boom academics, like me, will sweep out of universities into retirement. Now, that's a great thing for young PhDs because there'll be a huge number of tenurable teaching posts for them to take. It's also a bad thing, though, because it means it will get harder and harder to hold those young PhDs in postdocs, in research uh, fellowships, when there's so many more lucrative kinds of work available elsewhere in the academy and indeed outside as well. <coughs> and finally, every university in the next decade will wake up to the importance of corporate sponsorship and of philanthropy. And if you're sitting in a philanthropic trust, you'll have every university in the country coming at you wanting a grant. So we're coming into a very challenging environment. The strategic plan, the Beacon of Enlightenment, sets out a series of things to deal with this. And I just want to run through the headlines in it. Firstly, learning and teaching. We're going to draw a line in the sand on growth. This university doubled in its size in the last 10 years. We're not going to do that again. Instead, we're going to change. We're going to put back into undergrad teaching what used to be the most interesting thing about it, which was individual discovery research. <clears throat> Doing that means we need to change the pedagogy because it means we need to put the spotlight back on small group teaching, which is what I remember from university. And there's a pledge in the beacon that every student in every year of every course will have as a centrepiece of what they do a small group learning experience. Now, once you start putting research back into undergrad teaching, you start to focus again on analysis, on criticism, on group problem solving, you start to inculcate in the students the very things the, the employers tell us they're wanting. And we hope that's going to have an effect on the employability of our graduates. <clears throat> but there's no more money in universities. In fact, there's less money ahead for us. So to do this, uh, we can't spend more. We need to change the way we do some things, and one way is to put some of those things online. So in the beacon, there's a commitment to treble our spend on IT and e-learning support. This, of course, will help us respond to the needs, uh, the demands out there amongst our students for flexible learning through their little devices. <coughs> in research, we want to be ready to respond to what we see as this flood of 
uh, worldwide flood of government grant money coming. So we're creating a big interdisciplinary research fund so that we can very quickly put together teams across disciplines uh, without waiting while deans slug out who's going to pay for what, which can sometimes take a long time in the university. We're committing to doing much more of our research in partnership, but this means partnership with equals, which for us will mean international organisations, some national organisations. <coughs> We're going to recruit in our ten strongest fields high citation professors, by which we mean professors in the top 1% in the world in their field, so we can great, greatly multiply the strength we have in those fields. We're going to double the number of international PhD scholarships. So if you're a student sitting in Europe or in Asia and you've got an offer from Stanford and an offer from Cambridge, you'll have one from Adelaide which at least financially will be the same. <coughs> None of this will matter unless we can find ways of getting our star researchers back into the classroom. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you that a number of these things will address head-on our international ranking position, which is an important and inescapable thing universities need to do. Internationally, we're going to mainstream study abroad. This university has the worst record in Australia for study abroad. Less than 1% of our students go on study abroad. They love Adelaide so much, you just can't get them to leave. Now, the universities we like to be compared with, that figure's 15%, 20 25%. So we're going to introduce a whole raft of study abroad grants so that students at least have the means to pay fares to get moving on study abroad. Meanwhile, for those many thousand incoming international students we have, we're asking Adelaide-based alumni families uh, if many of them would take uh, an international student as a host. Now, we're not talking about an international student who stays with you, but uh, a place where a student can go for a meal now and again, a family that's going to drive them around, show them South Australia. Uh, because the problem we've had is um, here, as in other universities, is large numbers of foreign students, especially Chinese, arriving in groups. They rent a flat together, they cook on a walk, they speak Chinese, they go home without even their English having improved, let alone having ever been inside an Australian house. We want to enrich that experience for them in a very Australian, South Australian way uh, by creating this big international host program. And in the next few weeks, all our Adelaide-based alumni will be getting an email about this, seeing uh, if there are volunteers who'd like to take part in this. And in fact, we've got our study abroad coordinator here tonight, and we'll, I'll get to that. Um, shortly. Behind all this there's a series of enabling strategies. We're going to launch next year in the 140th anniversary a major philanthropic appeal. Um, there's a new branding for the university which you'd be aware of which plays again on this theme of the light of new knowledge, the Seek Light campaign. And as I said there's not new money so the deans and I need to innovate in budgets to make this possible. <coughs> Behind all this is an attempt to recapture the boldness of that first era uh, when Augusta Short made this university absolutely at the cutting edge internationally of higher education. So, I said that would take 15 minutes and there you go. The floor is open to questions and comments and there's microphones so if you'd like to put your hand up and ask something we'll bring a mic to you. Over to you. Yep, Professor, I was talking to another um, uh, alumni today and she said, and we were talking about our children who will be here in five, six years, and she said, ooh, socially it's very different. And I knew that and, and you spoke about that just shortly after you arrived in Adelaide. Uh, can you tell us what's going on there? Socially? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, when I was a student, and perhaps when you were a student, you know, you went to a lecture, and then you went over to the union, and you bought a cup of coffee, and put your feet up on the table, and talked to friends for an hour or so till the next lecture. Um, now, that, of course, is largely gone, uh, because most of the domestic students have jobs. So they come out of the lecture, and they've got money, so they want to design a cappuccino, and they grab that, and whoosh, they're gone. Uh, 
So it's killing the clubs and societies. Most Australian universities have had a sharp decline in the number of sporting clubs, social clubs. Um, the group that are on campus doing what I used to do are the internationals because they've got nowhere else to go. Uh, some of them feel they can't work or they're on visas that limit how they work. So in fact, you look around on campus and there is still the social life that we knew, but it's inordinately uh, the international students. Now, what to do about that? Um, well, it's a bit hard, you know, I mean, the clubs are in decline and a lot of the traditional things. But, you know, I say to my sons, who seem to spend, you know, they seem, I've got two sons at university, um, neither of them get up before midday. <laughs> my wife's absolutely tearing her hair out. Um, but I say, well, do you go? <laughs> I mean, what do you do? And yes, they go, but, you know, it's a totally different interaction because they're talking to, the, or the talk I used to do in the union, they're doing it through, you know, Twitter and, and SMS and so on. So it's, it's, it's changed and um, we need to accept that it's changed. And the problem is that, you know, a lot of those teaching here didn't live through that change and are still catching up. Yes? Professor, as a recipient of a Commonwealth Scholarship many moons ago, I'm interested in knowing how many Commonwealth Scholarships does the university receive these days? Well, I think you must have been on the same scheme I was, which is what got me to university. This is the old Commonwealth Secondary and then the Commonwealth Tertiary Scheme. Well, I mean, that scheme's long gone, uh, so it just doesn't happen anymore. And, you know, in place of it, we've got HEX, you know, the Deferred Payment of Fees, so, uh, which most domestic students uh, sign up for. So it's just the scheme is gone. Uh, did you hear that? Can we reintroduce it and go back to the minute? Well, we've got two candidates for the Prime Ministership who perhaps should be asked that question. <laughs> um, I don't hold much hope that either of them are going to say anything very positive. Um. I believe Augustus Short was uh, the first Anglican Bishop of Adelaide. Correct. And I believe that's why he came to Adelaide initially. Uh, I just wonder why I didn't mention that. Look, of course, he has a big career. Uh, um, as I mean, he was the first Bishop of Adelaide. At his, in his time, the diocese embraced the whole of Western Australia and the Northern Territory in South Australia. It was the biggest one of the biggest dioceses in the world. But, you know, he, his work there is long remembered and honoured. Um, my problem is that the educational part of his life, which was an enormous part and the part that mattered to this university, is totally forgotten and ignored. So, of course, I, f I focus on that, but it's no, I think most audiences I speak to know that, uh, that you know, he was a bishop here and his three degrees from Oxford, the first two were in classics, but the third was in divinity. But, you know, in those days, let's just remember that most academics were, cl were clerics. <coughs> Almost all the staff of Oxford were clerics when he was there. So, you know, a vice-chancellor was very likely to be a cleric, which is probably why the government thought it was such a good idea to appoint two local clergymen here. But there's a slight difference between them and someone with the kind of scholarly career that Short had. Yes? Uh, thank you for the presentation, Vice-Chancellor. It was, it was very impressive. I wanted to ask you about the MOOC that we hear so much about, the massive open online course. Do you see that as having any significance here? Do you see this university contributing into it? Do you see the university using it from other places? Do you see it as competition or something that will enliven and excite the teaching uh, at this <coughs> university? Now everyone knows what the MOOCs are. Um, this is the massive open online courses. This is a number of mostly leading American universities who've just thrown open all their course material or good chunks of their course material online for free. So anywhere in the world you can enrol in a course without fee, you can do the assessments and at the end you can get a certificate of completion um, <coughs> without ever having paid a cent. Um, so you've got courses with 50,000, 100,000 people enrolled um, right around the world um, and there are some people who think this is going to revolutionise where we're going. 
the MOOCs are only a little more than a year old. We haven't rushed into them um, because I think we need to wait and see what's going to happen. There's a number of problems with the MOOCs. Firstly, Coursera, which is the most interesting of the MOOCs, um, last year, the first year for which it had data, had a 7% pass rate. Now, no university can survive on a 7% pass rate, but what that means is that lots of those 50,000, 100,000 are tyre kickers. You know, they sign on, dabble, and then they disappear. Now, maybe in the end that'll be the great value of MOOCs because it's a marvellous way of dabbling in a university you're thinking about to see if you like the teaching before you enrol. And, uh, you know, it's a bit like Amazon.com. You know, when Amazon.com put the books it was selling online so you could read them, everyone said, don't be ridiculous, that'll skill, kill your sales. But, of course, it multiplied the sales because the more people browsed, the more they wanted. And the universities who are doing the MOOCs are finding that as a marketing tool, they're phenomenal because their applications have gone up. Maybe that's the destination. There's a lot of other issues with the MOOCs. One is authenticity, of course, who's actually doing this and what does the certificate of completion uh, mean. Um, and an another is the sort of inherently passive quality of it and the big challenge for the MOOCs is to simulate the active interactive experience. So I think it's, it's very early. We're, we're at the moment looking seriously at Coursera, um, perhaps doing a pilot or two to see how it goes for us. Um, <clears throat> but there's a much bigger effort at the moment trying to put some of our lectures online, uh, our own lectures online for our own students. Uh, Professor, I think my question uh, gives you a chance to build some more on that. I'm rather interested in the concept that you have of wanting to provide at the one level more uh, small level interaction for students, more of the tutorial type work and to make room for that you were proposing, if I interpret correctly, that there be more availability of things online so that students can use their machines etc. Now my question really is how are you planning to train staff to be able to change their teaching to make room for that? Uh, many staff I think don't have the skills to do that kind of work. Uh, people in some cases go to lengthy training to develop the skills to use electronic means, etc., etc. Now, how can we ensure that all disciplines have people of appropriate skills to do that in order to provide room for the tutorial type mm. thing? Mm. Yeah, look, what you say is, is true. That's a big challenge. Um, <clears throat> my eldest son, he of the 1500 person biology class, um, he got a first class honour last year, missing 30 lectures. <laughs> now, he waited till the week before the exams, then he downloaded the whole lot, watched them double speed, because he said the lecturer was so boring that until they were double speed they weren't even interesting, and then he got his first class honour. Now, the thing is, we need to decide if that's aberrant behaviour or not. Uh, we've got students who tell us they don't learn well in lectures anymore. So what I've been saying to staff uh, is this is not about adding a whole lot of small groups to what you're doing. Instead of giving 12 lectures a semester, why don't you think about giving one at the beginning, one at the end, maybe one in the middle, put all the rest online, and then use those weeks, instead of preparing handouts and overheads and lecture materials and lecturing, spend those weeks cycling through your class in small groups and ask them what are the problems, what didn't you understand? <clears throat> so that you put tenured staff back in, into, into small group rooms. Now, um, you're, you're absolutely right. We've got people here who are very challenged by this. We've got some who are already doing it anyway, um, and some who are quite excited about it, but others who are challenged. Now, a significant part of that trebling of the IT spend is, is not buying equipment. Uh, it's, it's staff development. We've just in the process of recruiting a whole online developers unit because the staff need, and we've got lots of staff who say, okay, well, yes, fine, I'll do it, but I don't know how, you've got to show me. So we're putting a significant amount of resource into staff development. This is the planning year. You see, what we're trying to do is next year, the first year enrolling next year, we want the first year students to have the beacon proposition, then the following year, the second year, as, and then the third year as they roll through. So we're using this year to plan these things. And I mean, amongst other things, we had a big 
teachers forum, teaching forum in the middle of the year where we had hundreds of staff in this room and um, six of our really most innovative teachers up here showing people how to do this. I was so interested that almost all of the six um, said they'd, they'd gone down this path because their lecture attendances had fallen to 30 per cent. And one of them had an aim, you know, her benchmark was going to be if she succeeded it would get back to 45 per cent. Whereas you see, I actually don't think that's what it's about. I think they're going to stay home anyway if they've got it online. So um, I think it's much further than that. But, but you're right, we've got a very significant challenge, but at the moment we're focusing on trying to develop the skills of first year, next year's first year staff, then we'll go to the second year and so on. Yes. Professor, thank you for your presentation. Uh, like yourself, I'm a humanities graduate and I've noticed a worrying trend in recent years in Australia for universities to downsize um, sorry, humanities departments and humanities courses. So I know in recent times, in my own time at this university, where we've had classes of very small numbers, they have been cut entirely. So from the, the perspective in your plan of refocusing on small classes, how, wh what is your vision to address this issue? Mm, yeah. Well, you know, the, the small group discovery is an issue of varying difficulty in different faculties. Like, for example, in the School of Medicine, where there's been problem-based learning, for some years already, though it's already done that way. Um, where great chunks of the curriculum are done in small groups. Humanities has been at the other extreme and where for two or three years now there's been this raging debate about abolishing tutorials, which seems to me to go absolutely the opposite direction from the beacon. I mean, you would think that in humanities would be the crucible of Socratic dialogue. Um, <coughs> So, um, I mean, we need to find a way that in humanities uh, we can have, you know, this small group experience, uh, not simply cutting off the things which are absolutely, uh, which I think are more important. I mean, I, I th actually think it's more important for the face-to-face -face things to be small than it is for the lecture theatre. You know, it's a terrible ego thing, though, for staff who've been used to giving lectures. You know, I mean, the first thing that happens when you roll onto online lectures is the pass rate improves. In my own, when I was teaching, my, the first course I rolled over into online lectures, the pass rate went up 20%. Because the thing is, the students, things they don't understand in the lecture, and which just whoosh, are gone, if it's online, they replay it again and again. They're sitting at home in bed, and they go over and over till they do understand. Now, it's a terrible drama for me to think that they do better without me in front of them. You know, so I, th I think, you know, we've still got some academics struggling with that. The, the experience will improve if they put the lecture material somewhere else. Now, you know, I mean, you can only do that with codifiable material. You know, when you're talking about stuff which is easy to transmit, it works well online. The thing which doesn't work well online is the non-codifiable lab work, you know, um, <coughs> debates. Lang language and languages. So, you know, these are the things that, and these are the very things that we must protect. Um, so, uh, but, you know, we're not through planning next year yet, and obviously we've got to sort that out. Yes? Professor, um, I lectured in physiology at the University of Nottingham. Yes. In the 1970s, I'd, uh, I'd lectured at the University of Adelaide in physiology as well before that. I, um, I had exactly that feeling. Um, I gave the cardiovascular <coughs> course lectures and one day in a staff meeting I got up and I said, I think this is, lectures are a waste of time. I think probably the best thing is for me to put all my lectures in notes, for the students to be given the notes and that f then I would give a number of small class tutorials on students who had questions or problems with the notes. This caused absolute shock amongst my colleagues. But I was interested in doing research. It would have given me much more time to do my research. I mean, I, I enjoyed teaching, but uh, I felt that this would give me more time to do my own personal research, um, as well as being on a more one-to-one -one basis with the students and exciting them and trying to interest them in my subject area. So I agree completely. Well, thank you. And, you know, there's, uh, 
Can I give an example from our School of Medicine at the moment? There's a wonderful man here who teaches anatomy and who came up, did his um, degree here then, was appointed the staff. When he studied anatomy, there was 50 in the anatomy class. When he got to the point of being appointed as a junior staff member, there was 100. A couple of years later, there was 200. <laughs> when it got to 300, he decided, I can't teach anatomy like this anymore. Uh, it's now heading to 400 in his class. So what he did was take all the lecture material and using an iPad, very simple thing, he split it all up into little 15 minute chunks, uh, inter interspersed it with little quizzes. And so before the students come on campus for this particular week, they must work through the four 15 minute chunks that apply to that week and do the quizzes. Now unbeknown, the quizzes don't count, but unbeknown to the students, the results of the quizzes are all feeding through our My University site and he gets statistics. So he knows what they're getting right and what they're getting wrong. And he says to me, Warren, I don't never know what I'm going to teach till I, it's Friday afternoon. Because on Friday afternoon he looks at the statistics, then he goes into his classes the next week and immediately just talks on the things they all got wrong. Um, and he thinks it's going far, far better. Now, the lectures, he also recorded the lectures as a whole, and they're still there. So if you work in one of these quizzes and you really don't understand, you can press a button and you'll get half an hour of him <laughs> in lecture mode on the subject. Um, but would he go back into the lecture theatre? No. But anyway, how could you teach anatomy in a lecture theatre of 400 people? So, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. This is fascinating to hear about it. I'd like to know about subjects like geology and botany and those sorts of subjects where so much depends on students actually handing the rocks and handling the, the plants and all that sort of thing. And I guess they can go out on uh, excursions, field trips, but I'd like to know more about that sort of aspect of new teaching. Well, you know, of course the field, the field trips mostly are small group discovery and we've got in our science faculty at the moment those departments thinking through what they're already doing which involves small group discovery and what needs to change. But again, you know, s some of those, I can't speak for geology uh, specifically, but s we've got some science subjects where currently the enrolment is 900 people. So you're not doing a whole lot of feeling physical objects when you've got 900 people, the objects would dissolve. So the thing is, we need to get away from that. You know, it's, I mean, when I was at university, there were two professors that changed my life, and they're the reason I'm here. Now, did I meet them in classes of 500? No, I met them in classes of 12, of 15. And I mean, this is what's gone. And, you know, people in Australia think that the massification of higher education happened everywhere. No, it didn't. It happened here and in the UK. It never happened in the US. Um, and this is the, one of our big challenges. We've got the US now recruiting in Singapore, Malaysia, places where we get students from. They're there offering a small class experience. They always have. Um, and we've sent, for 15 years, sent students back to those countries who've had huge impersonal experiences in classes of hundreds and hundreds or thousands. Now, five years from now, we'll be offering a small group experience. We'll be at, at one remove, I think, from the rest of our colleagues in Australia. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's going to put us in a special position. I went to a university in New York that has a million students and an average class size of 40. <laughs> now, for 25 years here, that's not been the case in Australia. So, you know, the small group feeling physical objects is something we have to get back or the whole quality of the education goes down. So that's what we're about. I'm sorry, I, I can't answer for geology specifically because I'm not up to date with what they're doing. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Just wondering if you could discuss the details about the uh, attracting the top 10 professors with the high citation and if there are any plans in the, uh, the scheme to support early career researchers who I find are the most vulnerable in the system? Yes, look, let me be clear about the beacon that, you know, the beacon is not the sum total of all of our initiatives. 
Um, the beacon is a series of headline things that we think will make a specific difference. Of course we have an early career scheme and we have plans uh, for that uh, ahead, uh, <coughs> as well as a career interruption uh, research scheme and some other schemes too. But the 10 high side professors, this is quite nakedly an, a, a plan to address the international rankings. You know, the ranking which matters most is Shanghai Xiaotong. Now, it's a bizarre thing. Um, you know, it breaks my heart when I say to an Asian student, so where are you going to go to university? Um, oh, you know, I'm going to Illinois. Oh, I say, you know, what are you going to study? Oh, law. Because I looked it up on the Shanghai Xiaotong and, you know, Illinois is 35 in the world. Shanghai Xiaotong doesn't rank law. You know, so, I mean, this is the worst piece of consumer advice we have in our field. Just terrible. If this was the car industry, you know, there'd be a scandal. But, you know, Shanghai Xiaotong measures a limited number of natural sciences and other disciplines. However, unfortunately, it's the game we're in. And a good ranking in Shanghai Xiaotong leads to an fl enormous flow of grant money. It leads to an uptake in student enrolment. So we have to play that game. And so these uh, 10 professors are not going to be chosen really to embrace necessarily what we think are the 10 most meritorious fields. It's money we're investing in the fields that are measured in the rankings. Now, the deans at the moment have just finished slugging it out about how we're going to select those fields. And uh, this is for next year, you see. So soon we will reach the point where we have to start making hard decisions. Um, so it's going to be unbalanced, but it's a naked play about the rankings. Oh, Professor, I'd just like to ask you about the alumni groups. Um, we all struggle to attract uh, actual uh, interaction between our old uh, colleagues, but um, uh, and they're a very important part of the future of funding and, and, and I guess, uh, graduate uh, jobs and so forth. Uh, what sort of plans have we got to try to embrace the, uh, the new generation who, who don't like going to clubs and so forth like, like they used to do in the past? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a very good question, you know, because one's picture of alumni events often is, you know, people of my age or considerably older. Um, the average age of an alum in this university is 40. Um, the largest alumni uh, groups, um, aside from those here in Adelaide, are in China. So when we do alumni events in Shanghai and Beijing, we have hundreds and hundreds of people there. Um, now, um, so we've got a lot of very young alumni, especially Asian alumni, and you're dead right, they're not interested in the annual carol service and in clubs and activities. They're interested in career mentoring, and they're interested in online networking and things like that. So now we have, uh, Kim could probably answer this better than me as the alumni manager, we have made quite a number of, of steps in that direction. We, uh, a number of our functions overseas uh, now uh, are about ca career opportunities, career progressions, and we bring employers, and that's what brings young people along to the functions, or else instead of formal associations and branches, we've got you know, online networks that are loosely based and Facebook sites and so on. So yes, we are, we are changing so that we shift the effort to where the big group of our alumni are. Yes. Professor, um, I noticed your remarks before about the former Prime Minister. There's rumours in the press, mind you I don't pay any heed to the Mur Murdoch press at the moment, but there are rumours in the press that she may have some role to play in this university. Can you clarify that? I can't. There's really nothing. I mean, that's a rumour in the press. Um, but, you know, um, I mean, in this university we've had quite a long tradition of having people connected with our school of politics uh, from all kinds of uh, political persuasion, Alexander Downer at the moment, and, um, um, you know, uh, who else have we got? Uh, Yes, the former Senator Natasha Stott de Spoyer, um, former Premiers, John Bannon. So, you know, now these people, if they, if they do things for us, are never paid. There are honorary connections, and it's usually in the School of Politics. Um, so, you know, if she becomes available after the election, 
she's a former student, so I'm sure our School of Politics would be interested to talk to her. But, you know, yeah, there's nothing I can add. I have a question regarding sustainability because um, I noticed you said that you want to become one of the highest ranking universities in the world and obviously um, sustainability is you know, a huge part of um, advancing and becoming more progressive. So I was wondering where that fits in with the beacon of enlight enlightenment. Yeah. Um, when you say one of the highest universities in the world, we've actually got a specific... We're, we're at, in Xiaotong at the moment, we're at 203, and our aim is over 10 years to get to 150. So now, it depends what your perspective is. I mean, there's 10,000 universities being ranked, so uh, 203, you might say, is in the highest ranks in the world, but uh, it's not the absolute highest ranks. But... Um, uh, it's not in our beacon because, as I said, the beacon is a series of headline uh, issues, uh, but in the operational plan that's behind the beacon, which is also in line, we've got sustainability targets um, spelled out. I mean, that's a very serious uh, venture, obviously, for us. has to be. <coughs> By the way, um, there's copies of the beacon for all of you tonight, and I hope you'll take one. It's only 12 pages long. It's a very easy read, and so I hope you'll take it with you and have a look. How are we doing for time? Um, look, it's ten past seven, and we don't have to stay in formal mode because there's coffee and tea going to be in the foyer in a moment, um, and, you know, I'm going to linger on and, and can answer questions informally. Where's Annette Wheatley? OK, Annette has been engaged as our international host program coordinator and so as I say you're all going to get an email soon to see if you'd like to be involved in this um, international student host program but if you'd like to know anything about it tonight Annette is the person. Why don't I take one more and then we'll perhaps go up the foyer. For <coughs> uh, professor I did see work experience in the fine print and being a, a round peg uh, um, is uh, is a good thing in a round hole, and that's what uh, if you can end up in your life that way, it's, that's uh, a dream come true. What um, what things you've got in place going forward to develop work experience uh, opportunities, engagement with um, business for individuals in yeah. the university? Yeah, well, that's another thing where we're very underdone here. Uh, we actually want to ensure that every student has either a study abroad experience or an internship or work experience pl experience placement. Now, we've already got um, an alumni career mentor program that takes about 500 students a year um, in their final year into, um, you know, in into, into the workplace, but we need many, many more placements than that, and this is one thing faculties are, think are thinking about uh, at the moment. Just bear in mind, though, the beacon rolls in. Next year is first year, the year after second, and the internships largely will be 2015. But yes, we need to get to the point where we would have enough such placements for one third of all our third year students to be taking an internship. Now, there's some quite detailed planning being done for that, but maybe I'll just leave it at that. Well, um, look, as I say, please, we can continue discussion um, upstairs in the foyer. Um, I hope you enjoyed. This is our best lecture theatre now. I think it's a splendid space for this kind of event. And uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>